When you're building or working on a 3D printer, most of the time you won't need to solder anything. But once you start using a machine for projects, there will come a time in every maker's life when you will need to solder a couple of things. So what are the differences between a $25 soldering iron and a nearly $200 soldering station? And is it ever worth spending that much more? We'll take a look at three different soldering stations, two USB powered soldering irons, and the no name station that I've been using for the last decade. We'll test how fast they heat up, what jobs you can use them for, and we'll find out which one is the best. Right after a message from today's sponsor, OpenBuilds. OpenBuilds makes it easy to design and build stuff that moves, from 3D printers over laser cutters to CNC routers. Of course, they've got all the parts for building a motion system with high quality, genuine V-slot profiles and the V wheels, but they've also got their own all-in-one CNC controller with the black box running Gerbil firmware and a matching CNC interface with Bluetooth, Wi-Fi and USB-C. Thumbs up for using a proper USB connector. And if you want to get milling or routing right away, you can grab their Router 11, which has a wide, actively regulated RPM range and already comes with a standard ER11 collet system. Right now, you can get 10% off on the entire store using code TOM10, so check them out at openbuildspartstore.com. The soldering irons and stations I'll be comparing today come in at a wide range of prices, but they're the ones that you all suggested on Twitter when I asked which ones I should test. So starting at the cheapest end, we have the Pineso, coming in at only $25, but after shipping, imports and fees, I paid closer to 40 euros until I could hold it in my hands. In the box, you get the main soldering iron handle and a single standard tip. The Pineso reaches operating temperature in 12 seconds, support for on-demand rapid boost feature. We're going to test that. The Pineso is made in China. Next up, we have the Miniware TS-80P. In the box, you get the body and a standard tip, as well as a USB-C cable, a power supply, and a grounding wire kit. The Miniware sells for about 120 euros. The Miniware is made in China. Next, the Hakko FX888D. This is a very popular soldering station combo among makers and it comes in at 125 euros. In the box, you get the iron itself, an iron holder, a sponge and curly brass wiper, as well as the main station. The Hakko is made in Malaysia. Next, we have the Vela WE1010, which is also a set of an iron and a base station. And this one is the education kit. So you also get a spool of solder, flush cutter and an extra tip in addition to the usual set of the iron, an iron holder and the base station. Just a basic set costs 145 euros. The Vela is designed and engineered in Germany and made in Mexico. And topping off the range for this test, we also have the Eza Icon Nano. You also get the iron itself, which is already connected to the base station, as well as an iron holder. Usually the Eza sells for around 195 euros, but currently the best offer is 210 euros. The Eza is made in Germany. So before we take a closer look at each of these setups, I should do the disclosure. The Miniware Vela and ESA were provided to me free of charge by SaneSmart, Vela and ESA respectively, with the option to keep for myself or give away to a makerspace after testing. As always, no money changed hands and none of the companies got any influence in this video whatever. I bought the Pineso uh, and the Hakko as well as my old soldering station with my own money. So you may notice that these aren't all exactly comparable. The different price, concept and power, but I also want to find out where the limits of each solution lie. The pine cell comes very bare bone and you will need to provide your own USB-C charger and cable or an up to 24 volt power supply with a barrel jack. And depending on which power supply you get, the iron will have an output power between 17 and 60 watts of usable output power. There is a limited compatibility list on the website, but it ran at 17 watts with the power supply I usually use for my camera, about 30 watts with this USB-C power delivery power bank and the full 60 watts using my Huawei laptop charger. Pine also sell a compatible power supply for $25 plus shipping fees and imports. The Miniware comes with a power supply that allows you to have its full 30 watts of output power. The Hakko has 65 watts, the Vela is 70 watts and the Eza is 80 or 68, so close, watts depending on where exactly you end up looking. My old station has 80 watts, supposedly, but I don't quite believe that. There is also the difference that the Pineso and the Miniware use what's called active tips, which are assemblies where the tip itself, as well as uh, the heater and temperature sensor, are a single part, while the Hakko, Vela and Eza use separate heaters that you slide the tip over. Supposedly an active tip corrects faster for external disturbances, like a PCB or component lead wicking away heat. Also, 
Companies like Hako, Vela, and Eza have a huge range of different stations with different features. These are already from their lower end of the range, and you can get even more basic setups from them, as well as super high-end kits that would be used in an assembly line. So with those differences and the price cap in mind, let's have a closer look at these soldering solutions. The pine cell's body is made from all plastic and it has this rubber sleeve at the front which does slide around. It is slightly taller than it is wide, but for gripping that is fine for my hands. There are two locking screws in the front where you can secure the tip, otherwise it is very easy to slide out by hand. There is also another screw in the back which allows you to connect a grounding lead and that has a low impedance connection up to the tip. The main user interface is through this tiny OLED screen on the body itself. You get two buttons to navigate the entire menu structure as well as to set temperature as you're using the iron itself. The operating system that is running on the 32-bit processor inside the soldering iron is Raleim's Iron OS, but there are several open source alternatives available. The included tip is the standard pencil style, but you can get sets of four tips with four different styles for another $25, uh, the same as the iron itself, which means after imports, taxes, fees, and all that, uh, it's going to be about 40 euros for a set of four tips. The TS-80P has an all-aluminum body. It has this ejector sleeve at the front that I guess helps you to get uh, hot iron tips out quickly. The tips use a headphone jack, which just slots into the body. There is no locking screws or anything, but this is quite secure as is. Just like on the pine sill, the back has a small M2 screw where you can connect the included spiral cable to ground the entire iron. Um, the body, as well as the power input, has a low impedance connection to the tip. The TS-80P has the same tiny OLED screen as the Pine Cell, but this one runs a proprietary firmware which is a lot simpler to use, but not quite as pretty. However, you can flash the same Iron OS to this iron that is running on the Pine Cell. The TS-80P's tip looks quite fragile with this very thin tube section in the back here. Um, these tips are available with a couple different uh, tip options, however you always have to buy this entire thing, just like with the pine sill, and these tips are fairly expensive. One of these tips costs about $22 plus shipping, handling, imports and fees on AliExpress, or 30 to 40 euros if I buy it directly from Amazon. The components on the Hako are a mix of materials. Um, the solder iron holder is all metal, this is all cast metal um, as well as the solder insert. It has a little rubber thing in here which I honestly don't know what it does because it doesn't touch anything. Um, the solder iron itself is a plastic handle with a nice molded looking rubber grip which is easy to slide off though. And you can actually see my old cheap iron is basically a straight up clone of the original Hako one. Um, the tips are interchangeable as well. The tips on the Hako are directly connected to the ground input on the plug, so these are straight up grounded. Um, the handle also, I was able to measure a roughly 100 mega ohm resistance to ground as well. So this is a ever so slightly conductive ESD safe plastic. The station's main body is all plastic. It has a small LED screen in the front. The power cable is fixed but the iron can be removed with this non-locking connector in the front. Because the Hako only has this three-digit LED screen in the front and two buttons, uh, using it and going through the deeper menus is a bit cryptic, so you will need to consult the manuals for some of the more advanced functions. However, adjusting the temperature is fairly easy. You just go in here and you can adjust every digit by itself, which I think is what you're going to be using most of the time, so that's good at least. The tips in the Hako are quite easy to replace, but since this is an all-metal construction, you will need to use a tool to undo this nut, as it does quite hot if the tip has been heated to temperature. Genuine replacement tips are about €6.60, and in case you're wondering about dollar prices, just replace that with dollars, they're about the same. Alternatively, you can also grab cheap third-party tips, but I don't know how good the quality of those are. I've gotten lucky with a couple on my no-name iron, but I wouldn't use them if you already have a good soldering station like this. And at six and a half euros for a genuine tip, like it's a, it's a real no-brainer getting the genuine ones. Overall, the Hako feels quite basic, especially with the small LED screen, but it is all very solid. This is all metal. Uh, the soldering iron itself feels very good, and it is a fairly slim main station, so it's not going to take up all that much space on your desk. The iron on the Vela is very confidently made too. It's got a very slim base profile, but then this nice, comfortable, squishy, almost foam-like grip at the front, which 
is almost a bit too large for my small hands, but that is just down to personal preference. It does have a bit of an edge back here at where the cable enters. The tips are replaced with the same mechanism as on the Hako, but this one has a plastic nut, so this one is always comfortable to the touch even when the tip itself is all the way heated up. And then this tip just drops out with a bit of effort. Just like on the other stations, the tip on the Vela is grounded as well with a low resistance. Um, the base station says it is ESD safe, but I couldn't measure a resistance between, or I couldn't measure conductivity between the handle and ground. The iron holder on the Vela is quite basic. Um, it's got this spring mechanism here, which, you know, gets your iron to bounce around. There are a couple spots for replacement tips on the side, and it does come with a sponge that you do need to wet before use, but no space for any of the brass curly wiper stuff that, uh, for example, the Hako and the Erza come with. The base station itself is very minimalistic. It has a rather large screen, which unfortunately is not backlit, so it can be a bit hard to read under non-perfect conditions. However, it is super easy to use. Uh, you can adjust the temperature with the buttons over here, or you can go through the three menu settings with this button down here, standby time, temperature offset, and Celsius or Fahrenheit, and that's it. A soldering station I don't think needs to do much more than this, and this menu system is pretty much perfect for what it needs to do. Placement tips for the Vela are available in any shape and size you'd like, and they are about six euros, a bit over six euros uh, each. The Eza is quite interesting because it is the fanciest one of the bunch. It does have a very techy, angular, playful design almost that unfortunately I think is going to look very dated very soon. It's got a very like 2010 aesthetic to it already. But technically it is actually quite nice. So starting with the handle itself, look at how small this thing is. So with my hands this fits pretty much perfectly and coincidentally it is a very similar shape to the TS-80P. I, I, you know, there might be some inspiration there. It's also got a very short stick out at the tip. Comparing that to the Vela, you're working much closer to where you're actually gripping the tool. So you have very precise control over where you're positioning the tip with your hand. This is all plastic. There is no rubber cushioning at the front, which honestly is fine. And the same as on the Vela, there is the plastic nut that allows you to remove uh, the tip very easily. The Erza's iron holder is quite interesting too, because the entire thing is made of rubber. There is this ceramic insert, so as you're sliding the iron in, and you might be touching the tip to it, you're not going to burn it. Um, this sleeve on the Vela is plastic, and on the Hako, it's metal. There is some of this brass shaving wool included, but no watery sponge, and I prefer it this way. And then on the back here, this is where you can store your tips. So either you can slide them over over these brass rods, or I guess you can also stick them in like this. The base station again has a display that is not illuminated, so you have to look at it at the right angle. Setting temperature is very easy to do. You just press up or down. And then for some of the more advanced settings, you have to hold both buttons and you get to calibration or to standby delay. If you need any more advanced settings, uh, you have a micro SD slot on the side where you can, I guess, store a configuration file to and just change everything you'd like. The tips are available in various shapes and sizes for about eight and a half to 10 euros each. But since the tip is actually getting snapped into this nut right here, which you have to press it out of every time you want to switch the tip, and that is quite hard to do. And I guess a burn risk if it's hot. I would recommend getting a couple of these nuts and like spacers as an extra. You can get them for about five and a half euros each, and then you can just leave them on your preferred tips and just swap them as a unit. Next up, let's do some actual tests with these stations. We'll test how fast each iron heats up by first seeing what it's reading from its tip, and then checking if the reported temperature is accurate by testing how fast it can actually start to melt solder after powering up. Then we'll see which wire gauge each of the irons can tin. We also test how much energy each iron can introduce into a solder joint by measuring how far it can heat up a large copper plane in 30 seconds. Lastly, we'll test how fast we can swap a hot iron tip in the middle of a soldering job. I've been using lead-free solder for over a decade and I've never looked back to the old days of using leaded solder. Lead-free solder is a bit less forgiving on bad equipment and bad technique. So not only will it actually force you to learn good technique, but in these tests, it'll nicely show the differences between each setup. Always use proper ventilation, and that is not just blowing the solder fumes away with a fan, but actually either filtering them or venting them outside. I'm doing both for these tests. Let's start with the heat up times. 
I'm measuring the time between powering up the iron and it reaching 350 degrees Celsius, according to its sensor. The pine cell saves the last set temperature and only requires the cable to be plugged in and one button pressed to start heating. It reaches temperature after just 12 seconds. The miniware does not remember the last temperature and it needs to be set manually each time. It takes 21 seconds to reach temperature. The hako only requires a power switch to be flipped, but it is the slowest yet at just over 35 seconds. The vela only requires the power switch to be flipped as well, but is even slower at over 46 seconds. The Erza goes through a lengthy startup process, but it still reaches temperature in only a bit over 14 seconds total and is only beaten by the pine cell. My old soldering station reaches temperature after only 13 seconds and moves into second place. But can we trust these numbers and does the temperature on the display actually match the temperature of the tip? I've pre-tinned all the tips with my favorite solder wire to make sure they can quickly wet and melt any fresh solder we get in contact with the tip. The pine cell starts off with only an impressive 15 seconds until it can melt solder. The miniware requires the extra step of setting the temperature, but is still ready for use after just 22 seconds. The Huckle has a much larger and heavier tip and it takes 30 seconds until it can melt solder. The Vela is not far behind and takes 33 seconds until it can melt solder. The Aza is very quick to heat up and only takes 11 seconds until it melts solder. Very impressive. And my old soldering station reports that it's up to temperature after just 13 seconds, but it takes a full 54 seconds until it can actually melt solder. So the pine cell and my old soldering station actually report to be at temperature even before they can melt solder. All the other stations are ready to use right around the time they display reaching 350 degrees Celsius. The ESA is the quickest one at just 11 seconds. The pine cell at 15, the miniware at 22, Hako at 30 and the Vela at 33. Next, let's see which stranded wire gauge these irons can tin. I've prepared equal 10 cm long bits of 2.5, 4 and 6 square millimeter wire, stripped 12 millimeters of the ends and twisted the strands. We'll see which of these gauges each iron can tin and we'll cut off the test at 60 seconds. For this test I'm using the solder supplied by Vela as I'm running short on the solder I'm usually using made by Felder. The pine cell has no problem tinning the 2.5 mm squared wire. The pine cell also has no problem tinning the 4 mm squared cable. The pine cell struggles with the 6 square mm wire and only manages to tin one corner. The miniware breezes right through the 2.5 and 4 square mm wire but only tins one side on the 6 square mm wire. The Hako easily tins the 2.5 and 4 square mm wires and finishes tinning the 6 mm squared wire right at 60 seconds. The Vela tins the 2.5 and 4 mm wires with ease and finishes tinning the 6 square mm wire in under 45 seconds. The Aza has no problem at all with the 2.5, 4 and 6 square mm wires and finishes each one in under 30 seconds. My old soldering station is already struggling with the 2.5 square millimeter wire. All these tests were done with the iron set to 350 degrees Celsius and usually I set my old station to the maximum 450 degrees Celsius to get any work done. However, the higher peak temperature increases tip wear and the amount of fumes kicked up into the air from the flux, so this isn't really something that should be recommended. Overall, none of the new soldering setups had any problems with the 2.5 or 4 square millimeter wires but only the soldering stations managed to tin the 6 square millimeter wire as well. The Eza did so very quickly and probably has quite a bit of headroom left. Next, I tested how much heat each iron can introduce into a difficult solder joint. This PCB uses 2 ounce copper and has a large ground plane on the back, both of which will try to wick away heat from our solder joint. I'll heat up one of the solder pads and measure how much the copper fill rises in temperature with my thermal camera. For the soldering stations, I'll also test this with a larger tip that should be able to store more heat and also more easily transfer that heat into the PCB. I'll stop each test right at 30 seconds. The pine cell starts off with a very solid performance and manages to heat up the copper field to 90 degrees Celsius in just 30 seconds. The miniware has a much smaller tip and only half the power, but it still manages to heat up the copper to about 80 degrees Celsius. The Hako ties for first place with the pine cell and manages to heat to 90 degrees Celsius with the pencil tip and about 100 degrees Celsius with the larger half round or bevel tip. The Vela pulls into the lead by heating to 92 degrees Celsius with the standard tip and about 102 degrees Celsius with the half round tip. The Eza delivers a very impressive performance by heating to 96 degrees with the standard pencil tip and 106 degrees Celsius with a larger chisel tip. My old station barely manages to heat the copper past 40 degrees Celsius with both the standard tip and a larger half round tip. Overall, 
all the new solder setups I'm testing today delivered very good performance. The Miniware drops off a bit due to its lower wattage and smaller tip, while the Eza definitely delivers the highest amount of heat into a solder joint. For the last test, let's see how quickly I can swap a tip without letting it cool off completely first. This is most likely not how you're supposed to swap tips and all the manufacturers recommend against this, but I can guarantee that almost nobody will be patiently waiting for the tip to have completely cooled off before they swap them. The Pinesel has two extra locking screws on the top and bottom, but then you can simply pull out the tip with pliers and insert a new one. This takes a total of 17 seconds. The Miniware has no locking mechanism and even features an ejector collet. However, the Miniware firmware crashes after inserting the new tip and restarts, requiring you to set the temperature again. Even with the firmware reboot, a tip swap only takes 20 seconds. The Huckle has a metal sleeve and nut that get hot during use. You need to use pliers or gloves to unscrew it when the iron is still hot. The tip then simply slides off and you can install a new one and tighten the collar. The Huckle is the slowest yet, and it took me 33 seconds to complete. The Vela has a plastic nut with the collar that doesn't get as hot during use, so you can use your bare fingers to unscrew it. The tip can be pulled out and a new one inserted. The Vela pulls into second place at just 19 seconds. The Eza also has a plastic nut that is very easy to remove. However, it seems that the tip is actually jammed on the heater now. This tip already felt weird installing it before this test when it was still cold, and on closer inspection it seems like the coating on the tip might have flaked off and wedged itself into the very thin gap between the heater and the tip. When changing tips on the Eza, you always have to push out the tip from this metal collar, so hot swaps are not the best idea in the first place, and usually people end up buying a couple extra nuts and collars to just leave permanently attached to their tips. Here are a couple more things I noticed or learned during the tests. While there is some documentation on the Iron OS firmware that runs on the Pinesel, the Pinesel itself has no manual. For the TS-80P, Miniware include only a very incomplete manual, and a full manual is only available for the previous generation TS-80, but not this TS-80P. I believe they are quite similar though, but in either case you have to find that manual yourself, it is also not included in the box. The cryptic abbreviations in the menu are explained in there, for example, if you want the iron to start up with a temperature other than the 300 degrees Celsius, you have to explicitly set that in the menu. Honestly, I wouldn't have figured that out. The Miniware and the Pinesel have an accelerometer and wake up from their sleep function simply by picking up the iron. The Hako, Vela and Eza require you to push a button on the station to wake up. The Miniware also sometimes crashes and reboots when you pick it up to wake it up from standby. Lastly, the Eza has no rubber feet under the station, so it very easily slides around on a table. So which of these irons would I recommend? They each have unique features that none of the others can provide, um, but overall my favorites are the Pinesel and the Vela. The Pinesel is very cheap, and even after adding a suitable power supply, it still is by far the most affordable option in the bunch. It performs very well, and is almost but not quite comparable to the larger Hakko. I think in a lot of cases the Pinesel will be a perfectly suitable option. The Miniware TS-80P is better made than the Pinesel, but its high base price, ridiculously expensive tips, and the buggy firmer make the Pinesel a universally better choice than the TS-80P. Also, what's the point of having a 32-bit processor in a soldering iron when the software running on it just isn't any good? The Hakko FX888D is alright, but its soldering performance is at the bottom of the bunch of the actual soldering stations, and the tedious LED display menu isn't doing it any favors either. The Vela WE1010 is actually the least flashy of all these stations, and I like it a lot for that. The hardware is well made, it's robust, and most importantly, it is incredibly easy to use. Then the Eza Icon Nano is probably the hardest one to judge here, and I like that it's trying to not just be another soldering station. It is definitely, by far, the best performing soldering setup on this table, but I can't shake the feeling that it's trying to do too many things at once, and in the process ends up forgetting what's actually important to make a good product. So I hope you enjoyed this not quite 3D printing related video. I had a lot of fun making it, uh, doing something different every now and then, really helps get those creative juices flowing. Obviously, shout out to Project Farm for the inspiration for the video style. All these videos are viewer supported, so maybe consider grabbing a YouTube membership, uh, check out Patreon, or just like, subscribe, share. That's always appreciated too. Thank you for watching, keep on making, and I'll see you in the next one.